This episode is brought to you by Hunt Hickory Creek. And new to Hunt Hickory Creek this year is their Central Kansas Lodge. They're going to be running hunters from the end of October all the way through January. And their main hunting area is located between Kavira National Refuge and Cheyenne Bottoms. Central Kansas is a special place for waterfowl hunting. And during the peak migration, those refuges hold hundreds of thousands, if not close to millions of ducks and geese at a time. Mainly speckle belly, snow, and lesser Canada geese, mallards, pintails, and widgeon. You may have an opportunity to harvest all of these species in one hunt. You'll be very comfortable every morning in their Avian X A-frame blinds or laying on backboards, and they hunt over 1,200 of the industry's finest decoys. So visit their website at www.hunthickorycreek.com for booking information and follow them throughout the year on Facebook and Instagram. And don't miss your opportunity at a hunt of a lifetime with Hunt Hickory Creek. If you're going to hunt Kansas, hunt Hickory Creek. Welcome to the Fowl Front Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, where our goal is to recruit and educate new hunters while entertaining the rest of you. Without new hunters and the mentorship of those more seasoned, this passion as we know it faces an uncertain future. So get the word out, turn the volume up, and enjoy the show, because you're on the Fowl Front. This week's episode is brought to you by Dive Bomb Industries, the fastest growing, most affordable decoys on the market with unmatched customer service. Visit them online at divebombindustries.com, on Instagram or Facebook at Dive Bomb Industries. Or go ahead and give them a call anytime, seven days a week at 314-322-7468. And go ahead and use the promo code FOWLFRONT, all under case with a space in between foul and front, for 10% off your next purchase of Dive Bomb Decoys. This episode is also brought to you by Grip Pack Calls. If you want to produce a more versatile, realistic, and higher quality sound with all the ease of a double read, whether you're looking to up your game or just starting out, let a Grip Pack Call work just as hard for you as the Grip Pack crew did to develop and bring you next level quality with easy blowing calls. Grip Pack Calls. Find your grit. This episode is also supported by Goose Ninja Call Lanyards, MDR Custom Woodworks, Twisted Wire Upland Hunts out of Grand Island, Nebraska, and from our friends over at High Prairie Sportsman over on YouTube. This week we're going to be talking to Megan Lupian um, about photography, and don't uh, don't tune it out just yet because we're going to be talking about uh, you know how to how to capture. Uh, those moments in the blind, out in the field, and things like that, and we're going to do it in a in a way that's hopefully not scary, right, Megan? Oh yeah, absolutely not scary at all. Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna explain it because uh, I just got my first camera, so this is a super selfish episode, everybody, and uh, I definitely needed like a little crash course, and that's exactly what this is. Uh, so don't turn it off if you're not into photography. This is this is to uh, um, hopefully motivate and inspire you and it kind of push you over the edge. If you were thinking maybe it's not something that you'd be able to do or, um, anything in that manner. So like I said, today we got Megan Lupian from Megan Lupian, uh, photography, and she also does quite a bit of, uh, work with Hunt Hickory Creek during the waterfowl season and, uh, other seasons, right, Megan? Oh yeah, absolutely. I try to go out to Kansas at least each hunting season that there is. They try to they keep me busy out there. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. So, how did you how did you first get into uh, photography? It started about ten years ago. I got my first DSLR camera, and I was really big into landscape photography. And then I kind of transitioned more so into portraits and weddings. And then I started my business eight years ago, and then I graduated college and decided to take my business full time. So here we are now, and it's nice. I get to make my own schedule. I get to be kind of selfish and go to Kansas whenever I want and see Chase and help them out. And then I even take off a few months during winter so I can go spend all the waterfowl season out there. So now you're not just, but you don't just uh, shoot the camera, right? No, I'm pretty much, I help them. I officially, my title, I was, I went out there to kind of help cook and clean and 
And then I started helping the guys out and we have like a really good system. Um, we're definitely, we're such a good team and I would help them put blinds up and decoys, brush in blinds, all that good stuff, as well as going out there with my camera and getting to photograph those hunts for everybody. So, you know, I, you said that you first got into it and you were really big into landscape photography. So did you grow up uh, with like a pretty uh, outdoors childhood or something? I did. We did a lot of camping when I was younger. And then my dad, he's a pretty big hunter. He's never waterfowl hunted before. Not yet, at least. I'm trying to convince him. But he's always deer hunted. So I would always go with him. I remember when I was younger, we'd always get pulled out of school for a week. And we'd go up to Pennsylvania and go hunting with him, my sister and I. So that was great. We were always the boys that he wished he had. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. Awesome. So, uh, when was the first time you went waterfowl hunting? It was two years ago. Two years ago. And yeah. what was your, what was your first duck? Mallard. Mallard? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. So. I was hooked immediately. Why don't we touch on a little bit, the big three. Oh yeah. You kind of need to, to kind of get a basis of what you're looking for when you're trying to buy some gear. Yeah, Exactly. Um, so you want to go ahead and break that down for us? Absolutely. So the big three, it's the ISO, the aperture and the shutter speed, and just kind of like a general idea. I know we'll touch more into this and go really in depth, but just to kind of understand as far as equipment. Um, so ISO is controls how much sensitive, how sensitive the camera sensor is to light and aperture is how much light is reaching the image sensor in the camera. And then shutter speed, this is kind of like the most confusing for people to really understand. It's pretty much how long your camera spends taking a photo and how much the length of time your camera shutter is opened and exposing to the camera sensor. Shall we get into bodies? Oh, yeah. So there's so many bodies. I personally, I shoot a Canon Mark III and I also have the Canon 60, which is also full frame. But there's so many different kinds. So those, the two I just named, they're DSLRs. And they don't have built-in lenses, which is kind of nice. You can easily swap them in and out, and which provides you like a huge wide variety of options that you can shoot with. But pretty much a DSLR camera has a shutter and a sensor. And the way that works is when you press the shutter, the camera records the scene as a digital image, as digital image on a sensor. So I said earlier how like my Mark III and my 60 are full frames. So that means it's like a larger sensor and it's typically more of a professional quality. And a lot of people kind of get confused with that because they are a little bit more expensive. But if you're looking for a good professional camera, I definitely recommend a full frame. But pretty much a full frame, it's better in low light situations, which... I mean, everyone kind of knows if you're into photography and you have those early mornings when you're trying to like set up and then also sunset when it's right at, right at like light is pretty much gone. Like those, those cameras really help with that. And they also create better bokeh and when bokeh is pretty much the background blur. So like a good example of that is when you say you have like a duck in focus and everything else around it is out of focus. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much, that's your bokeh. Okay. And so there's full frame. And so that means it's got kind of a a larger, um, sensor. Uh, Yep. Absolutely. It's got a bigger, like little plate down there that's collecting light. Yeah. Pretty much. When you kind of like look into your camera, if you even like take your lens off your DSLR and look into that's your sensor. Okay. And then what, so what is the alternative to full frame? Uh, what's that called? Um, a crop sensor. And those are still, those are great cameras. Um, Especially, too, if you're just starting out, like, those are like, great. I started off with a Canon Rebel T3i, and I used that for about a year or so, and then transitioned into my full frame. So what but, What else is there to evaluate a camera body on? Like, what are the things that I should be like, uh, you know, I don't really like know what I'm looking for. What are like the different things we can judge a camera body off of? They always look at how many megapixels there are. Okay. The number, the larger, the quality, and they can make super sharp prints. 
So people who are trying to kind of get into um, like maybe even selling their photos, you definitely want to have a lot of megapixels because that definitely will help with that and just a really good quality print, really good quality photo. Okay. So megapixels. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. And then also I look at frames per second. That's how many photos you can take per second. Um, obviously kind of the higher, the number, the more useful it is shooting like really fast action scenes, which too, with waterfowl, that's really important to have. So that's how many times the the shutter can like flick open. Yep. Okay. So what is a, what's a mirrorless camera? I personally have never used one. I've heard great things. They do some have full frame sensors, but they, the way they work is they don't use a mirror box to project light directly, directly into the viewfinder. Hmm. mirrorless is exposed to incoming light by default with nothing like in between they typically they're kind of i know like sony i think just came out with a mirrorless camera that supposedly is like amazing but they are normally smaller and a little bit lighter than dslrs and they do have some full frame sizes that have come out recently is there anything else that we need to be looking out for I mean, they do have some point and shoot cameras, which you can't change the lenses and they're a little bit cheaper, okay. but they're, they're decent. But I mean, if you're really trying to get into photography or definitely look at a DSLR, most cameras, I mean, every camera has a autofocus and manual. I typically auto most right. of the time just because it's so much quicker. Um, but when you, that's another good thing to look at when you're looking for a camera body is to see how many auto focusing points there are. Um, that can help you kind of gear you into like how sharp the photo will be and stuff. Okay. Yeah. Cause I didn't realize that the, the body, it, it kind of, it motors the, the lens, right? Oh yeah. It, like yeah. I've, I've always said if you could spend the money on either a camera or a lens, spend it on the lens. You definitely want good glass. What are some of your recommendations, um, for, for bodies? So I'm a Canon person, so I'm pretty biased when it comes to Canon. Okay. But but obviously, if you have the money, go for the Mark III or Mark IV. I personally, I have the Mark III right now, um, but I've shot with the Mark IV. I actually rented it when I shot a wedding in Colorado a few weeks ago, and I absolutely loved it. It's a full frame. It's professional. It's great. There's so much you can do with it. Um, but then again, if that's maybe a little too much out of your budget, the Canon 60 is also full framed and pretty reasonably priced. And then mm-hmm. even a Canon Rebel. And I know there's a lot of options with the Rebels. I know they have, I want to say like eight models now. Okay. And that's a great starter camera. I bought mine like off Craigslist uh, for like 200 bucks. And it's like a Nikon uh, 300. Um, I believe that's 300 or 3000. I can't remember. Um but, uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm having fun, like just playing with the, the, the big three and trying to figure it out. And then once I think once I can take a decent picture on, on that thing, then I think I'll prove myself ready to, uh, maybe like buy something nicer, you know? Yeah. Time to upgrade a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. See, I've, I- I've shot with some Nikon cameras before, but I personally, I started with Canon and it's kind of hard once you start with a brand with a, with a certain model. You can't, it's too hard to kind of go back and relearn everything. Sure. Okay. That's that's something to consider, I suppose. (laughs) And even too, I always recommend if somebody's on the fence about what kind of equipment they want, you can always rent it. I know there's from, um, online, like borrow lenses and also, um, borrow lenses is typically the one that I use the most, but I know there's a few different other sites Okay. And it's pretty, it's not normally too expensive and they, there's, you could rent anything, you can rent lighting gear, lenses, cameras, and it really does help if you're like, you know what, I don't know if I really want to buy this, then you can go on there and rent it and see if you actually really like it before you spend the money. That makes, I didn't even know that that kind of thing existed. So I'll, maybe that's oh, yeah. what I'll be, that's what I'll do. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think I'll take that. any of those out into the duck blind though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. When I rented that Mark IV for the wedding I photographed, they had to, they were like, okay, do you realize, like, I had to sign, like, all this paperwork pretty much, like, do you realize, like, you, how expensive this camera is, like, you can't mess it up. I'm like, okay, I get it. <laughs> you get yeah. it. Uh, yeah. Oh. I would probably oh, yeah. need that, though, you know. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I definitely would not take this out hunting because my luck, I would drop it in the water. <laughs> oh, man. 
Have you done that? No, knock on some wood. Luckily, I have not. Yeah, I think I'll be taking it pretty much just to the uh, just to the field hunts this year. So. I'm pretty cautious with my stuff. I think because it it technically is my full time job being a yeah. wedding photographer. So I'm like, I can't, I cannot mess up my gear. And it's funny because there's times where I'll be standing in the water and Chase is like, Megan, you don't have your strap on. Like, don't drop it. I'm like, I know, I know. <laughs> Just have to be extra cautious. <laughs> That's funny. No, yeah, I've, you know, it's your livelihood. For me, it'd be just that I would never get another camera probably if, if I went and bought a, a nice camera and then came home and showed Natalia that I dropped it in the mud or something and it no longer works. We just, yeah. we would be cameraless for until I could save up. <laughs> yeah, so. she probably would not be happy with you at all. No, no. So should we talk about lenses? Absolutely. So lenses, that's very, it's kind of a lot of information, but they're, it's pretty cool. Um, so typically when you're kind of looking at a lens, there's a huge variety. You can have a wide angle, you could have a normal, you can even have like a telephoto lens. Um, I personally, I shoot a lot with my 85 and my 7200 when I'm hunting and that's 85 millimeter. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And that's a, um, it's a prime lens. So it has a fixed focal point. And so I love that because it kind of allows you to be creative. So when you say fixed focal point, you're talking fixed focal point is more so meaning you, you have like one fixed distance, I guess you distance. could say like, a, okay. Yes. Um, so like a 50 or 85, like a 7,200, you can move it, move it to where you could be closer or farther back, but like an 85, you have to physically move in order to get like closer or back. But I, I personally, like, I love shooting them. Um, I love the prime lenses. I have the 135, the 85, the 50, the 100. And I like, because for my style, they have, um, a large maximum aperture. So they have really pretty background blur, which is that bokeh we talked about earlier. Right. And they perform perform really well in low light and they have pretty good image quality. Okay. But then again, I love my photo lens, which is the 7200 because it's just awesome. I mean, you can do so much with it. And so the you, 7200, the telephoto, that's like where you that that's that's where you say you can choose the different distances. Mhm. Right? Yeah. Okay. I could be sitting in a blind and I could shoot really close, pretty close up or pretty far, far away. Okay. So when you say, you know, 85 millimeters, right. And 135 millimeters and like 70, 200, can you explain kind of how, like what those numbers mean? So the numbers pretty much, they are the, the distance. So when you're looking at a lens, they see M on them. And that means the focal length that's measured in the millimeters. Okay. So a lot of lenses, like I know, um, the, like the three lenses choices I touched on a few minutes ago, the wide angle, then then the prime, and then the telephoto, those each have like the numbers. Each lens you'll see will always have like the sort certain distance. Okay. And the like the the smaller the millimeter um, to millimeter, like the the range. Kind of like say a six a sixteen to thirty five. That's super wide angle. So say you have like it's on sixteen it's everything like those are typically what you see a lot of landscape pictures because there's so much it's so such a vast wide angle shot which i i will recommend too i have the 16 to 35 and i use that a lot when i'm hunting because you can get so creative with it i mean you could be laying on the ground shooting up and you can see i mean it's just it's cool it's a great for it's great for hunting Okay, so you you only get to take two lenses um, out on your next you know hunt. Um, what, what two lenses are you going to take? Ooh, definitely my seventy to two hundred. Okay, um, that's the telephoto one that you said that's really versatile. Yes. Okay. So the seventy two hundred, and then oh, this is tough. Well, the past season, I pretty much all I brought with me was the seventy to two hundred, and then my sixteen to thirty five. But probably my 50, my 50 and then my 16, I mean, I'm sorry, my 50 and my 70 to 200. 
Those would be the two that I'd bring. Uh, What's next? Oh, aperture, right? Oh, yeah. So when you're kind of looking at lenses, you'll see on the camera, like you'll have a certain letter, like for example, say like 70 to 200, 1.2. So that means the aperture. The aperture is the hole that's inside the lens. It opens and closes to control the amount of light entering into the camera. And they're typically represented in F values like 1.2, 2.8, stuff like that. I personally, I shoot a lot on like 1.2. Um, it's, sometimes it's harder to miss focus. But for my style, that's typically kind of like what I shoot on. Unless I'm shooting like a, a big group of people, then I'll bump that up. One of the last things we here have is the image stabilizer. So that's huge, especially too when you're like shooting stuff that's moving. It helps to minimize blurness. Um, and it's typically represented as IS, and okay. it's also super good when you're shooting in low light. But then again, it's typ- typically a little bit more expensive. What else do we got here? <laughs> I know we've talked about kit lenses a little bit too before you and I did, Ben. Um, yeah, that's right. So pretty much a kit lens is kind of what you buy in a package. So when like a package deal, when you go to like Best Buy or something and you buy a camera and it comes with a lens or two, those are typically the kit lenses. And they are great. They're, I mean, they're phenomenal starter lenses, especially if you're trying to kind of just get started in photography. I, I recommend them. But they tend to be a little bit cheaper, and they do have that kind of mid-range zoom. I know the pretty generic lens that comes with a kit lens, a pretty generic kit lens is the 18 to 55, like 3.5 f-stop to like 5.6. I think that's what I have. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty. I, I want to say that comes with pretty much like any camera you buy, like in a package. Gotcha. But it's great. I mean, it's just such a good variety because it goes from wide angle to like a kind of a normal eye. The way the way I kind of look at it is if it's like a 50 millimeter lens, that's the, what your eye can see. So, okay. I mean, the 18 to 50 kind of get like a generic range, but they don't typically produce sharper images and they kind of have slower autofocus and then two they they have the limited length range length range and limited aperture right when i go to take a picture like it sometimes it like takes a second and then it finally clicks like yeah that's like the hardest thing that would get on my nerves (laughs) it does it's 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 like be faster it's like come (laughs) on like i'm trying to i'm trying to capture trying to get this photo yeah like my kid only smiles like every now and then. So I'm like, you know, uh, oh man, like missed it's it. It's like camera in the face 24 seven. Yep. <laughs> but it kind of stinks too, because the kit lenses are not the greatest in low light. If it were up to me, like my, what I would recommend is to sell your kit lenses and then use that money to upgrade to something better. Okay. Yeah. Cause it really does. Lenses are super important. You could have a decent camera and a great lens and you'd be set. Awesome. Good to know. Uh, that's, that, that's what I'll probably be doing. I, I don't know. I'll, I'll probably be saving up for like a little bit nicer body. Um, and then, you know, maybe asking for Christmas for my wife or something for, you know, yeah. if you're listening to this, Natalia, you know, buy him but, some camera gear. Yeah. You'll win wife of the year. Yeah. But it's kind of cool too, because they're constantly updating camera bodies. So like lenses kind of stay the same for the most part. Um, but as far as cameras are constantly upgrading, so you can always like, right. they're const- you can always buy, I mean, down the road, buy a new one, but lenses, I mean, I, I still have lenses from when I first started 10 years ago. And they don't, they don't like change the body so that you can't use the lenses. No, so pretty much if you shoot Canon, you would need Canon lenses. Um, and same with Nikon, but they do have like Sigma. I have one Sigma lens. It's a Sigma 85. And they do make Sigma for Nikon and okay. Canon. And I think even Sony. Kind of like a third party. Pretty much. The okay. only thing with that is it, they tend to kind of not have the greatest focus. Okay. Um, you have to get it calibrated that if somebody's like trying to and they do they are a little bit cheaper so i always recommend if you do buy like a sigma to make sure you always like get it calibrated uh should we talk the big three in depth now oh yes i hope this isn't where we lose people (laughs) nope this is you know if if for nothing else this is just for me so (laughs) (laughs) yes and this is super important (laughs) all right so the big three 
like this is like so far when I've been playing with uh, you know these settings in manual mode, which is like I'm only trying to just shoot manual mode so I can learn this stuff. But it's kind of like nailing Jello to the wall. Like you adjust the ISO, and then all of a sudden, like now your aperture is too much. Okay, so then you adjust the aperture, and then you know now I have to adjust the shutter speed, and it's like just playing with like all three variables at once can be pretty frustrating. <laughs> Oh yeah, it person, really is. So. And it takes practice. I mean, I cannot stress it enough. You just have to practice. That's all there is to it. All right. Well, should should we get into it? Absolutely. Go ahead, teacher. <laughs> teacher, oh boy. So, pretty much in order to get like a perfectly exposed photo, you have your ISO, your aperture, and your shutter speed. And I kind of look at it as like like a pulley system, like a triangle. You need all three of those to get like that perfect shot to get it like exactly like the way it's supposed to be. So the different, the different things like ISO aperture and shutter speed, I know we kind of touched on this earlier, but to really kind of go a little bit more into depth. So I'll start with ISO. ISO is controls like how sensitive the camera sensor is to light. It will affect how well exposed the photo will be. And they range that your ISO ranges anywhere from like 100 to like 6400. So, like a kind of an example of what your ISO really does. If it's super sunny outside, say it's like noon, you'd have to have a lower ISO like 100. And then, say you're shooting like sunset or it's like almost dark outside, you'd have to have a greater ISO. But the only bad thing when it comes to having a greater ISO, you have more noise, which is kind of like the grain and it's not the greatest mm-hmm. quality um so that's another thing too which makes a pretty big difference as far as like kind of gear wise as like your equipment if you're if your camera doesn't handle low light the greatest then sometimes like when you have a higher iso you'll have like the more the more grain in your photos okay okay so aperture is how much light you're letting into your camera and it's often shown as like the f number Um, And I know we talked earlier, like 1.2 is super wide open. So the greater aperture means the more light that reaches the image center. And it's kind of confusing because like 10 lets in less light. Like say you have an aperture, like 10, like a stop of 10, that's less Mm -hmm. light. And then 1.2 lets in a ton of light. Right. And I know I kind of touched on earlier, like if you're you're shooting 1.2, it's a little bit easier to like misfocus, but it, kind of the way I shoot it creates better bokeh that blur, bird that blurred background and all that good stuff but then again if I'm shooting like a hero shot and I have 18 guys and that I need to get in focus mm-hmm. I'll have a higher s higher f stop like and like an f stop eight so I can get everybody in focus and I always keep everybody on the same plane which that okay. means like the same so if you're looking at a picture it's like the same like, line of people like it'd be like uh, perpendicular or something. Is that what you yeah. mean? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So there's someone's not at five feet and someone's not at 15 feet. Yeah, exactly. Cause then they'd be just all, all out of whack. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. So 1.2 means it's like basically like wide open and you're just getting like a flat, like whatever distance that you're focused at. Like, yeah, pretty much. So okay. if I'm shooting like 1.2, I'm taking a picture of a person. I always focus on the eyes because the, then they'll always like that their face will be in focus and then okay. it creates that really pretty, the background will be blurred. Okay. Um, and then like F stop eight, like a higher F stop, it's more is in focus. Okay. Gotcha. So if you're shooting like a cool landscape shot or like a shot of, of like all these birds um, and you want everything to be in focus, you definitely want a higher F stop. Okay. Awesome. And then the most confusing one of them all shutter speed. Right. This uh, this doesn't seem so confusing to me, but I'm I'm waiting for it because I um, obviously like this is the thing that I like. I I end up like having to have like a half a second shutter speed to get the right light or something. So go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> it really does. I think shutter speed was really hard for me when I first started because I was like, hold on, like I'm having such a hard time with the numbers and all of that. But it just like I said earlier, it's really it's just practice. So the kind of the way you want to look at a shutter, like look at shutter speed is like your eye blinking. The length of the time that your camera is like open. Like, so think of like, like say you blink really fast, then obviously you're not letting in a whole lot of 
light. And then if you blink really slow, you're letting in a ton of light. So pretty much like the shutter speed is like the length of time your camera shutter is open and it's exposing the camera sensor. And it really means, honestly, like just how long the camera spends taking a photo. I mean, it can freeze actions. It can create blurring motion. It all depends on like the speed. So pretty much um, most cameras can handle like a really fast and really like slow shutter speed. Like a slow shutter speed would be like 30 seconds for a super long exposure. And then like the quicker the shutter speed, the darker the image and like the longer the like longer it's typically like the brighter the image right right because it's it's got more time for the the light to seep in yes absolutely to to saturate the uh the sensor correct yeah okay so like when i'm shooting what i do to get kind of like my big three and to get that perfect like perfectly exposed photo i always set my iso first I kind of like look around and see like, okay, like it's pretty sunny right now. Like I, I need a, a lower ice, like ISO mm-hmm. and then I'll adjust my F stop compared to like, kind of like what I'm shooting. And then I go into my shutter and then okay. I'll adjust my shutter speed. So when we, when we talk about shutter speeds, so like, what is it like stars? It takes a lot. Like, like you have to have it open for like 20 seconds or something like that. Yeah, if you want to get like that cool, like long exposure photo, you definitely want to have it open for a while. But then again, you would probably need like a a tripod or something to make sure it like holds steady. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, you're definitely going to get some of that image blur. Somebody like walking, you know what I mean? Like what's setting for that shutter speed? It kind of depends on like your other settings it it really like it really it's crazy how much they all play into each other right um it kind of depends on what time of day it is how light outside it is and all of that what kind of shutter speed do you need to catch uh somebody kicking a soccer ball you know without it being blurry or something like that yeah you definitely want like a faster shutter speed like i know like for birds you want like one one thousandth of a second or faster one one thousandth of a second Mm mm-hmm Oh yeah, I <laughs> definitely nowhere. like super fast. Right, <laughs> and I don't. And if, if you've never picked up a camera before and you're thinking, oh, okay, well, you just you know take the photo or whatever. Like, I don't. I haven't been able to like figure out how to take anything like higher than I think like one four hundredth or something like that. Um, well, it probably doesn't help too with your lenses. Yeah, that's true. Because you, you you have that kind of like fixed aperture and you mm-hmm. can't really go that low. So when you're taking such a quick photo, I mean, you need a lot of light essentially. Right. And when you have such a higher aperture, you're not really letting in as much light. It, light makes such a huge difference in photography. Yeah. I didn't realize how hard it is to take photos inside. Yes. <laughs> I know. Like I, I deal with that a lot, especially being a wedding photographer. I constantly like typically I'm shooting inside a lot and that's another thing too like my camera can handle really low light situations great right but you typically need like a a higher ISO for situations like that but I mean I always recommend um if you're just learning you can put your camera on manual mode and because I mean obviously your camera is super smart (laughs) and you can put it on manual mode so it picks the settings for you It'll pick everything, your ISO, your aperture, your shutter speed. Sorry, I'm auto. thinking manual. Yeah. No, that's fine. I haven't shot I haven't shot auto in so long. <laughs> right. But <laughs> um, yeah, you can put it on auto mode and then you can kind of see what your camera is telling you to do and then go from there. I mean, you can be like, okay, so say my ISO is 100 and my camera is telling me, so maybe I can bump it up and just like play around with it. Right. And I mean, it really, it really does make a pretty big difference when you just kind of get to practice. Right. And there's, there's auto mode and then there's like, it, there's other modes that will just set, like it'll only play with like one setting or you only play with one setting and it adjusts the other two. Pretty much. When I had first started, I shot on programmed auto, which is the P. If you look at the dial on top of your camera where you can switch it from like auto to manual mm-hmm. and stuff like that, you'll see there's like a P, a TV, a AV, all of that. I shot on P for a while until I kind of realized like what I was doing. Okay. Um, and that helped me a lot. So pretty much it's kind of like the halfway point between automatic and manual. 
Um, you can control a few settings like your ISO and stuff like that. Even the, all the different modes, like all the different modes. I know there's aperture, priority, shutter priority. I do know that Canon and Nikon is a little bit different. I think the only difference, though, as far as the different modes is the shutter priority, if I remember correctly. But you should have a P on your camera. Okay, perfect. I'll, I'll check but, I mean, it, it really... It really does. I mean, if you are just starting out, just practice with it and see like, and even too, like I stated before, like if you put it on auto and see what your camera tells you to do and then just go from there and just like, okay, well, if I tweak this, what will it do if I tweak this and right. stuff like that? And can we pull over real quick and talk about this? So, you know, you talk about practice all the time, practice all the time, just, you know, you know, throw it in the, throw it in the stroller or throw it in the car, you know what I mean? Like, and bring it with you. Can we talk about like, the comments people like make when you first start carrying around a, uh, like a big camera. Oh yeah. <laughs> I didn't, it was not something I was expecting. Like, Oh, Hey, look at Mr. Professional photographer over here. And it's like, Oh uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's like, I'm just practicing. My yeah. favorite is like being a professional photographer. Everyone is like, Hey, can you bring your camera to this family outing? Hey, can you like just bring your camera and snap these pictures? <laughs> or the or my favorite, oh wow, your camera must take really good photos. Like, well, actually, like there's a camera and then there's a photographer. And right. a, the photographer has a lot to do with it. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then too, if you put a camera in someone's face half the time, especially like like you were saying, like if you're out like at like a sporting event or something, like people are like, What are you doing? Why are you taking my picture? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It's it's not like you're holding up your cell phone onto them, like. But like, I did feel kind of weird because I went to the park yesterday and I was trying to like get some good, you know, shots, some action shots of like a little baseball game going on, you know. And like people were like looking weird at me. I was like, oh, I should have like brought my 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 baby with me or something. But I ended up like leaving like halfway through. I was like, ah, oh, I don't want to. <laughs> like people are. Everyone like, probably thinks you're a total weirdo right yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But hey, at least you're out there and you're practicing. I mean, because it really does. It makes a huge, huge, huge difference. Because that and like even too for me, it's funny. Um, I told, like I said earlier light makes a big difference and I'm constantly I'll be driving down the road and like oh wow like that light right there is so pretty like oh wow I wish I had my camera on me because like that light is just gorgeous because yeah. it really it's funny when you really get into it and you really like enjoy it and love what you do you just it's like you your eye I feel like you kind of person like you you're always looking at something like you're always wanting to take a picture yeah, that was the other thing too. Is is kind of like like once you kind of, and I wouldn't say it, it's. I don't think it's the same for like having an iPhone like camera. But like once you like have a camera and you're like actively trying to train yourself in it, you kind of like think about the world in a slightly different lens. Um, oh yeah. Know? So or you see it in a different lens, and it's kind of funny. You really, I mean, you really do. Like I'll look at like things differently. Um, when I'm out in Kansas, like it'll be just like a regular fence post. I'm like, wow, like that's, that would be a beautiful photo. Oh, wow. Like the way the light hits, uh, it's be like, it's a, would be awesome. And I mean, it's, but it's a good thing too, because I, it, I recently, I saw this thing on TV that was talking about what makes you a photographer. Is it knowing the technical side of things like the ISO and the aperture and the F-stop, like what we just talked about? Or is it your creative eye? Right. And it really made you think because it's anybody could technically teach them how to work a camera. But does everybody kind of have that creative creative eye? And I do because I feel like everybody kind of sees the world. Obviously, they see it differently and they see the beauty in right. different things. But it, right. it kind of makes you it really makes you think. Yeah, it's an art and a science. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it really is. So. Especially too after just talking about the ISO and the aperture and all of that. Yeah, right. It's like <laughs> like you have to learn the science part and then you can go be artsy. Like, you know, kind of the, the entrance there. It, but it, re it really does. <laughs> so I guess sweet talking about art, you know, being the, the you know, the creative side. Um, you want to get into some, some of your like techniques? Uh, yeah. Your style? Definitely. I, um, I know I kind of touched on earlier, like how I shoot pretty wide open. Um, 
But I, if you look at my photos, you can kind of see I have like a lot of like warm colors, like browns and oranges and sometimes even like pinks, which a lot is done in like post Lightroom, but also in camera. Um, I kind of like changed my Calvin and all of that. And then I like to shoot right after sunrise or sunset and get that like really pretty like golden hour, Mm -hmm. um, which is awesome because it really, especially in Kansas, you get that like perfect sunset oh yeah and you you have like those oh like amazing skies yeah there's no trees in the way (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) i know you can see for miles and miles and miles but um another kind of like example like a technique that i normally do so like say it's like 2 p.m and it's pretty bright out and there really isn't like any cloud so it's pretty much just like wide open sunlight um i would kind of position like my subject in a shaded spot like underneath a tree if there is a tree or something to where there's some shade um and to help and then get my settings where they need to be and then to kind of help with it not being so blown out in the background I would have a higher ISO which helps lift the shadows okay because sometimes you think like oh it's like two o'clock you should have like 100 ISO it's super sunny outside but sometimes um you couldn't even use like having a higher soda even to like help lift up that right bright light and lift up those shadows and stuff. Okay. And then some other little things. I personally, I only really like to shoot when it's sunny outside. Okay. Um, cause that if it's cloudy, it really it doesn't really fit my style that much. Sure. And then, um, this is super, super important for everybody. Um, you typically want sun at your back. So the subject isn't like full light. Well, that's helpful for, for hunting ducks and shooting. Oh, absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. That, that way it's like full light, but then again, you can also position your subject with sun at their back. But the only, I personally don't really like to do that a lot because it kind of creates that rim light and rim Mm. light is kind of a light, that will, and like it even will create like, um, lens flare. So that's like, if you're shooting, like say I'm taking a picture of you, Ben, and you have your back towards the sun, um, you'll have that through like the lens. You'll have like light popping through technically. Okay. And I personally, I'm not a huge fan of that, but it can be done. I typically don't like to do that. I always go towards having full light on your subjects, but the only bad thing about that, like you say, you're taking a hero shot everybody's staring directly at the sun, right. which isn't the greatest. But another tip to kind of help with that is you make everybody shut their eyes. And then you say, I'm going to count to three. And when I count to three, you open your eyes and then just say, look at the camera and smile pretty much. So it's like their eyes are only open for one quick second. And then, so they're not staring at the sun for who knows how long. And I think it's important to pull over here too and talk about what a hero shot is because I think I went for a very long time thinking hero shot, hero shot. What does that mean? Like, <laughs> yes. I, I will say Chase is phenomenal at hero shots. Really? Yes. I mean, he's got a pretty creative eye. Like Chase is a pretty good photographer, but his hero shots, like the way he sees stuff, I'm like, okay, like I see you. Like go on with your bad sales. <laughs> that's funny he, that's funny um when i shoot hero shots i always make sure bellies up geese ducks bellies up and you i you always want their heads facing the same direction yeah i'm i'm super ocd so like that <laughs> makes me so mad i'm like come on like you just take the extra minute and just flip their heads uh, come on boys you know like put the heads over to the right side like. it's like get, get your life together <laughs> yeah and then you oh <laughs> And then you always just get low. I okay. mean, yeah, you definitely just kind of get low and shoot up pretty much. They're cool shots. I love how it creates, like, it captures that memory. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Like, that's one thing that I really enjoy when I'm out in the blind, like, with everybody. It's just, like, really, like, getting those memories and those moments. And I want people to, like, look back at their photos and be like, oh, wow, like, I remember exactly how I felt that day. And the other thing, too, is, is people, like, it's – the tailgate picture all, you know, all, you know, over again with the, the hero shots and stuff. But it's, I don't know. There's, there's something to be said about like, no, like it's, it's nice to remember that, you know, you shot 16 birds, you know, that day with this many people. And like, you, 
it's like inhumane. Well, not necessarily inhumane, but kind of like, why are you bragging? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. And the way I look at it too, like what if you're, I mean, 10 years down the road and like you're showing like your kids like, Hey, look at this hunt this day I shot with like this day I went with my friends and look at this. And cause it really does. It, it captures that, that memory. Right. And they can, right. there's some cool hero shots. Like there really is some awesome ones out there that I have seen. Yeah. And they're so fun to like position yourself. Like I, I did one. Um, it was actually the last day of duck season and we had this awesome group out there and, what I did was I had them on the other bank and I had my 70 to 200 on and I shot from across the bank. So I, it framed them really well and it was a really pretty sunset. It was like almost like, almost pretty much like kind of like pink outside. Nice. And it really, <laughs> it did. I'm like, this is awesome. Like, I don't really have to like edit this too much. Awesome. And it really, it was kind of cool the way like you can frame everything and like the trees and the water and all of that. And then I guess, uh, so the other approach would be like, so low light situations. I know you touched on it before talking how gear can get you pretty close to what you need there. Um, but you know, how do you handle low, low light situations? It kind of depends. Um, obviously like the higher ISO, the more grain, but sometimes Mm -hmm. like you can kind of play around with that. I mean, film is coming back into style and obviously like film photos are super grainy Yep. And sometimes like having a higher ISO, like in having that grain kind of does look pretty cool. Um, I know this past season we were, Chase was um, skinning, not skinning, I'm sorry. Um, he was cleaning a deer and I was out there just kind of getting creative and I had off camera flashes and um, I ended up kind of positioning it to where I had like a off camera flash behind him. And then I had on camera and then I also That's like had a remote flasher, right? Pretty much. I have okay. a pocket wizard and the pocket wizard, um, r- like triggers from my camera to the off camera flash, like a kind of like a walkie talkie. Okay. And you just got like super creative with it. So I know a lot of cameras like, um, DSLRs, like I know, um, the, there's some that come with flash. So even too, you can kind of get creative with your flash. If you have that, what are the tenants that you need to, to get for these fast action shots? You definitely have to have a, a super fast shutter speed. Like what I like one, one thousandth of a second or less to kind of freeze that motion. Um, and you sometimes have to jack up your ISO. And I mean, like I said before, like don't be afraid to really kind of play around with that. Right. I know sometimes it's kind of like frowned upon to have like a high ISO, but sometimes you kind of have to, um, and just honestly, just practice and you really want to predict where the focus is going to be. Um, it's obviously like a bird's moving super fast, like just like kind of like when you're shooting, you want to kind of predict where your shot's going to go. So you right. want to kind of predict where your focus goes. Oh man. I personally, um, what'd you say? <laughs> I said, Oh man. Oh Yeah. <laughs> Um, there's like three different focusing modes on a camera. Um, I'll servo, um, one shot and I'll focus. I personally, when I'm shooting motion, I switch it to I'll servo, um, which pretty much means like your subject is moving. Okay. And then I'll servo means the subject is moving. Yes. Okay. It pretty much you or the subject is moving. So if you're, if you're trying to kind of get those action shots, even like birds in flight, um, if you're at like a soccer game, that's definitely kind of the mode I would recommend that you would put your camera on. Okay. And then I'll like one shot, okay. neither is moving. And I'll focus means that neither you or the subject really cares if the focus is kind of accurate. All right. And then I guess maybe the opposite of fast action shots, uh, like super close up. So like water drops like off of a, a you know, a mallard's curls. So to kind of like achieve those photos you need a macro lens and a macro is 100 millimeters um i i love mine it's so fun to just get creative with it you can do so much with it um so if you're kind of getting those like cool close-up shots i know like um i know you've seen like the pictures of like the dog's eyes where they're like looking up yeah like that's definitely like a macro shot right there um so if you're really trying to kind of get those, I would definitely recommend a macro lens and okay. that's the 100. 
Okay. But then again, you never want your shutter speed. If you have a macro lens, you never want your shutter to go under two hundredth of a second. Under two hundredth of a second for macros. Yeah. Okay. But they're such fun lenses. Like I recommend them. I originally had bought mine for weddings, but I love just taking it out in the field with me and just getting to like be super creative with it. And so all of this aside, the art, the science, um, talk about what are some of the, the foibles, the things that get you out there when you have a camera, um, out in the blind, um, like things that you have to also consider to be able to capture these things. Cause I mean, you're, you're either sitting in a blind, you have to hide, you know? Um, yeah, it's definitely pretty crazy out there. Cause it's hard. I mean, if you're trying, you're trying to hide, but you're also trying to take pictures, you really just like try to stay hidden. And I normally, I bring a ton of, gear, like I bring a ton of gear out with there with me. I have a big Pelican case that I fill up with all my lenses and cameras and, and I just, <laughs> You, yeah. You bring that out to the blind? Sometimes I do. It depends on like how I'm feeling. Typically, I'll just fill up my little Sika bag and with like two or three lenses. Yeah. You would be so like I'm a I'm the kind of guy that always like gets a little irritated when like the the one dude like just starts like he sits down in the in the A-frame and he just starts like pulling out everything. He's got like six bags and he like takes up half the blind. <laughs> you know? Yes. I'd probably be the person you hate then. <laughs> you have to like go get like a layout blind for your, your Pelican case. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> pretty much. No, I was pretty good last season. I kind of kept my Pelican case in the truck and then I would just bring like two or three lenses with me. Right. And if worse comes to worse, if I needed to, I'd go back to the truck. But yeah. I mean, I, I was pretty good about judging of what I would need and stuff. Nice. And I'm like really cautious with my gear. So I would always like I have neoprene cases. I'd put my gear in and I'd always bring like a lens cleaning kit and extra batteries. And especially too when it's super, I mean, you know what it's like in Kansas. It's so cold out there. Oh yeah. I would, um, my batteries would die so quick. Oh so yeah. I'd always, For I'd sure. always bring little hand warmers Yeah, like and keep I- them in my blind bag. Yeah, like it, you know, it's bad. Like when you like look at your cell phone, and then it's at like a hundred percent when you get out of the truck, and then just about the time you're done setting up, it's like at four percent, and you have to like put it next to your body to like get your charge back. Yes, so. Chase would laugh at me last season because I would literally have like my camera in my clothes with me, trying to like warm <laughs> it back up. I'm like, it's just too cold for it. So here's a here's a question, and I, I experienced this trying to get some close ups of uh, my dogs. Um, how often do you have to wipe nose prints um, off of your of, off your camera lens? Does that happen uh, quite frequently, or is that yes? <laughs> yeah, it does. And I always I bring a lens cleaning kit with me out in the blind because you never know. I mean, that could make or break a shot. If you have like a water droplet on your lens, like you, I mean. It really can make a huge difference. But yeah, that happens a lot. Yeah. So I've had issues with my portrait photography like through my business. I had a kid one time come up and like just kiss my camera lens. <laughs> and you were like, like um I was like, No, no, why did you just do that? <laughs> oh his man. parents were mortified. <laughs> Oh, were they? Because I there's some parents that would be like, "Oh, that's cute," you know. Oh, like his parents were definitely. They were like, "Oh, I, I cannot believe my child just did that." <laughs> that's awesome. Yes. So this uh, should we talk a little bit about uh, your transition from how you you went from being a, a wedding photographer to being a you know outdoor photographer as well? It's and pretty then, crazy because it's such obviously it's such two different like fields. <laughs> yeah. And I, I really, I really enjoy being an outdoor photographer. I, I love kind of just getting to sit back and get creative with everything and weddings. You definitely, it's a little bit more high energy, a little bit more high stress. But then again, I love shooting weddings, but if I had the opportunity and say I was only photographing maybe five weddings a year and then just doing all outdoor stuff, I would be so content and so happy. <laughs> awesome so we already talked that you had your first your first duck was a mallard yes right so when did you you said you started uh hunting waterfowl two years ago but you'd Mm -hmm. grown up deer hunting 
Yes. So tell us about your first duck hunt. Hmm. So actually, to be honest with you, like my first waterfowl was a Canada goose. Okay. Oh, I mean, that's fine. I always just say duck. Cause. Oh, yeah. I mean, but I think ever since that first hunt, like, I was hooked. Like, if you were to ask me what I preferred shooting, I'd probably have to say, like, geese. Yeah. And I, I don't know why. Just there's something about, like, a Canada goose that comes in and it just it gets you so pumped up. It's like looking around, like, while it's flapping its wings coming in or, like, gliding in. And it just and it's just so big. And Yeah. Yep. And but then, then they, again, they, like I love, like I love, I love shooting ducks. I mean, I personally like I really enjoy eating duck. So for me, I'm like, okay, like that kind of is definitely a huge motivator. And then too, like it's so fun. It's definitely it's a little bit more difficult. I feel like so it's more of like a definitely more of a um uh I lost my train of thought. Like a harder shots or yeah there, uh, yeah definitely like a harder shot. So speaking work. speaking of which, so what do you what do you shoot? I have a Winchester SX4. Okay, I love it. I'd recommend it awesome. to anybody. Oh. Um, and so this last season, um, you were talking a little bit about how you came out and you were supposed to just kind of help out with uh, <laughs> the you said the cooking and the cleaning and taking yeah. photos, but next thing you know, you're out there setting up decoys and. Oh, yeah. We went, I mean, there was days where we went, like, a few weeks straight. And it was a lot of work. Like, I have so much respect for guides, Chase, and everybody else. Like, they they bust their butts. And I was out there helping them, getting up every morning super early. And we had so much fun, though. I mean, we were such a good team. I cannot say enough great things about Hunt Hickory Creek because we really are. We're such a great team. We all work together really well. And We always have like our system. I normally, my job was typically like kind of blind duty and I'm so OCD, like brushing and blinds. It's like right up my alley. And (laughs) oh yeah, Chase is like, Hey, you can take that. Like, absolutely. You go ahead and do that. Yeah. That's (laughs) excellent. I'm like, okay, I have to get every single spot perfectly. (laughs) Oh, that is, that's a good, uh, that's a good quality to have in, in your blind brusher. So yes. But I love it. I mean, I had such a blast and it was funny because like towards the end of the season, like it was, I mean, obviously it's so cold and kind of, we're getting kind of tired, but I mean, we like the last day of the season, I was so upset. I'm like, I'm not ready for it to be over. I was like, we just went, we went pretty much two and a half, three months. Like I was just not ready for it to be done. It's, you know, and I can't wait. I'm coming down to do that, you know, that piece with Chase. Um, where we basically just do a day in the life. There's a pretty big difference. Um, oh yeah. Because you know, you talk about doing it like every, like day in day out, like that's a marathon. Whereas oh, yeah. like a lot of us are, you know, we're sprinters or mid marathoners hitting it the weekends really hard. And then trying to get out, you know, once, once, you know, during the weekday, if we can, and heck, I know how tired I am, maybe a 50 hour work week and hunting two days in a row. Like that exhausts me. <laughs> yeah. So, it's it's one of those things where it's got to be a totally different thing that I'm super excited to to see uh, get a, a short glimpse in this upcoming season. Because there so. really is there's so much more into it than people really realize. I mean, I have such mad respect for them. I used to always give Chase crap. I'm like, hey, you don't do anything. I'm like, you sit in a blind all day and <laughs> just being being silly. And then I go out there with them for two and a half months, and I'm like, okay, like. You got like you guys are busting your butts. You were out but there I, last year with them for two and a half months. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I'm and doing it again s- this year. Are you? And I'm so excited. Yes, I'm Good. like counting down the days. I'm ready. Awesome. And so yeah, if I you're, could go ahead running. and start, if I could go ahead and start packing right now, I totally would. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So you were out there two and a half months there with Chase, and uh, you still said you still said yes after that two and a half months, huh? Yeah, he always jokes. He was like, I saw that she could do it for that long. Like, obviously, I need to kind of go ahead and wife her up. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know Chase Chase told us a little bit about um, how he proposed out in a, in a goose field, but how did that go down? Um, so pretty much it was a, like a really nice sunset. And to be honest with you, I was like sitting in the blind, like kind of 
dread, not really dreading breaking down, but just kind of like taking in a few minutes of just peace before we started breaking down. And I was, I think I was on Facebook and Chase was like, Hey Megan, come over here and take a picture of this blind. And I was like, I really do not want to get up and take a picture of this blind. <laughs> and I was a little peeved. I'm like, I really like, I'm like kind of relaxed for it right now. Like, let me just be in peace for a second. But I ended up getting up, and then I see, and Chase was so fidgety. And he's not. Like, Chase is so, like, calm and collective, never gets nervous. I'm like, why is he so fidgety? And then I look over, and our friend Reagan, who is this phenomenal photographer, he's, like, to the right of me. And I'm like, what is Reagan doing? And then all of a sudden, like, Chase, like, grabs my hand. And then Jet comes running over, which our dog, Jet comes running over with, like, the ring box in his mouth. And it was perfect. And... <laughs> Everything like I, it, it was so us. I mean, hunting is our thing. We get to do it together. We really love doing it, and it couldn't like have fit us more perfectly. Yeah, so it was really, a, it was great. Here's, here's a question that's uh, been in, in the back of my mind for quite a quite a while since I've not creeped back far enough, and I don't think I've found a uh, a picture without hi, him in a beard. <laughs> so I actually, the way I actually know Chase. Um, his mother was diagnosed with breast cancer and she wanted to get family photos done with her three boys before she lost her hair. So I go out and I do their family photos and Chase walks up. This is the first time I ever met Chase. He walks up with his dog with Jet and Jet was a little puppy. And immediately I was like, okay, like he's got a puppy like this is okay. And <laughs> Chase had a very short, like he still had facial hair, like kind of like a beard, but it was short and very like clean cut, clean cut and nowhere near what it is now. So that was like first time I met him. So a few months had passed and then it was like full on like beard and craziness. Is it staying on for the wedding? Probably. Yeah, <laughs> it probably will. Awesome. It doesn't bother me. I mean, it's him. Yeah, Absolutely. And he, he pulls it off pretty good. He kind of jokes and says it keeps his face warm for waterfowl season, but I secretly think he likes it. All right, so back into it. You're perfect. Okay, you only get to hunt one more time ever. Who's it going to be with? Where's it going to be at? Uh, what are you hunting? And what are like the weather conditions like? You know? Oh, okay. Um, I'd say Kansas because Kansas is so special to us. And... Um, pretty, I'd say comfortable temperatures to where like, you're not freezing, but you're also not like sweating. Right. And obviously chase. And I would love, I loved if I could have anybody out there, I'd really love to have my dad and I really love to have Chase's dad and Chase's grandfather. Awesome. That would be really special, really special for us. So are you, are you getting your own dog? So, I am. Okay. Um, if everything was planned, I think I would kind of be picking him up at the beginning of December. All right. That's if everything as far as like her heat cycle and all of that. So we'll see. Right. All right. And you're going to do all the training yourself. I'm thinking so. Yeah. I think I might go ahead and I, um, do the kind of the cornerstone gun dog mm -hmm. route and do all of that myself. Well, that'll be fun. It'll be interesting. Yeah, yeah, I love absolutely. doing it with Chase when he's out ch training Jet and stuff. I love going out there and helping him. Jet doesn't really listen to me that much because obviously he's Chase's dog. Right. But um, I do. I really enjoy that. So I'm excited to kind of get my own puppy and teach him and do all that good stuff. So what what's your most memorable hunt um, up to this point? Hmm. Okay. Um, there's probably three. Obviously, the one where Chase proposed. And then we had a great group of guys, and they were from um, Louisiana, and they were just awesome, awesome group of guys. And we shot a nine-man limit, and I think Chase might have actually said that this was one of his memorable hunts, too, but it was just a great day. We shot a nine-man limit um, pretty quick, and it was just good time, lots of laughter in the blind, and jokes, and good hunting, and and then I'd have to say my other favorite hunt, I wasn't um, like shooting the, at this time. I was just taking pictures and everything was frozen. And it was a, we were hunting this lake and we had like one little hole open 
And once again, we shot another limit of ducks. And we had this group in from Georgia, and they were great. We're still friends to this day. We still keep in touch on social media. And I took some phenomenal pictures. So that's probably my most memorable hunt when it comes to photography. Awesome. It was cool just kind of getting out, getting on the ice, and there's pictures of Jet walking across it, and it, w- it was pretty cool. Yeah, I, I think it's pretty cool about kind of the dynamic that you guys have going on down there. So not only can you just get on a bang-up hunt with, like, good people that you're going to have fun with, but also you can walk away from that weekend, like, with the memories captured. Oh, yeah. Uh, with You know, through you. So that that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I really – I love – getting to do that because sometimes this is like a hunt of a lifetime for some people and oh, yeah. get to walk away with the full gallery of photos and they get to look back and show their friends and their family and they get to kind of look back at that moment and be like wow like I remember exactly how I felt when I was in the blind like after we just crushed a limit right I I, I love it I mean I love everything that Chase does and everything that they do and the people you meet I I just love everything about hunt hickory creek pretty much in like the waterfowl industry um so are you pretty excited for this the, this new expansion oh yeah i'm pumped it's gonna be so, awesome what's the vibe like um at duck camp fine a lot of fun i mean a lot of people just kind of sitting back and laughing and talking and getting to know each other and everybody everybody shares their stories and that's pretty cool to see um especially people who and I got to hunt all over. You kind of get to hear their stories and like the favorite places that they've been and what they've seen and what they've done. But yeah, I definitely say camp is a lot of fun. Um, I, I personally like getting to cook and stuff. Like I love kind of just, they'll be, I'll be cooking in the kitchen and they'll be in the dining room and I can hear them just talking and laughing and it really, it's a lot of fun. And I know you guys use that Traeger. Uh, me and Chase were talking about it uh, earlier and, so it's my dad's birthday today, and he's like he's had a Traeger for like I think since they came out. So I'm trying to convince all my other siblings, and they don't listen to the podcast, so this is safe. Um, but I'm trying to convince my siblings, like, hey, we need to get dad a new Traeger, you know, for his birthday or for Father's Day or something. And then uh, you know, I know where that Traeger's going after we get him a new one. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> I love it. I mean, I recommend if anybody like spend the money, do it. We, we like are always using our Traeger. Yeah. They're a little pricey, but the thing is, is awesome. It's just that you can load that hopper up with the pellets and then set it on the dial that you need to and just walk away from it. Yeah. That's why it's so easy for us. When I was out there for Turkey season, I mean, we literally, I'd put a thing of ribs on and then just kind of set it and walk away. And you don't really have to worry about it. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I love it. We we lucked out. Um, there's this group, Hunitarian, and they stand for so much. They're all about, like, eating yeah, this wild. Is, this is the, the guy that used to be the, the surf photographer? Yeah, AJ. He's okay. awesome. If, hopefully he, you know, is listening to this. Uh, but I think I'm going to definitely want to hook up with him and talk to him about – because he's got something really cool uh, – with what he's doing uh, you want to exp- i mean <laughs> explain yeah, what absolutely. it is a little teaser <laughs> he so aj he's this great guy and um he kind of started off he was a vegetarian and then he realized like he really missed meat and his like body really missed it so he um started hunting or i think he'd always kind of hunted but then he like got big into just where he only eats wild game like meat that he has harvested so him and his family they eat wild game and um they came out he came out for a uh, goose hunt and it was just so cool. Like he's this phenomenal cook and he taught me so much when it comes to like cooking goose and duck meat. And he really like what they stand for is incredible. I I think so highly of him. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. He's, know, he's a cool dude. Yeah. I know Chase showed me his, his Instagram or his Facebook. I can't remember which one uh, the other night. And I was, I, I wrote it down. I was like, interview this guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he so, takes like some cool photos too. Well, I was going to just ask one more question before we get going here and uh also it's just another selfish question, but you know, you're you're kind of um well, I wouldn't say new now because if you look at, you know, 
uh, time spent in the blind, you've probably got quite a few of us beat actually now, but you know, uh, two years, um, you know, into waterfowling and as a woman, no less, um, I am super excited for my daughter to, um, you know, get out in the blind with me someday and like kind of, you know, teach her to be a, a waterfowl woman, you know, and, uh, just a hunter in general, you know? Um, yeah. and I was just curious if you had like any advice for, cause like if there's any differences for, you know, women in, you know, hunter, you know, in hunting situations or like, um, just kind of the things that you might have to put up with or not put up with, um, you know, in that particular regard. I would say I've been pretty lucky. Um, mostly everyone's pretty respectful. I know sometimes it's kind of hard. You go to duck camp and you're like, oh, there's, why is there a girl girl here type of thing? But um, I would just say, like, just have fun with it. And I mean, a lot. I'm, there's a lot of men who really like enjoyed seeing me out there and seeing me helping the guys and seeing me just out there kind of hunting with them if stuff like that. And, um, I mean, they were like super respectful and I've thank, thankfully I've never had any issues and no one's ever really talked down to me. If anything, everyone's always been very helpful and very encouraging. So I would just, I mean, for like, that's so exciting for your daughter, but when she gets older, like just go for it, like just have fun and, don't worry about what people think. And I mean, it's not just a man's sport. It's a, can be a female sport too. Yeah, exactly. Well, all right, Megan, I appreciate you coming on and uh, I got to, thank you you so much, Ben. I had a lot of fun. Yeah, this was fun and also informative. Um, Yes. I hope, I hope you learned a lot. (laughs) I I did. I did. And I'm sure the, you know, I'm sure the listeners uh, did as well. And maybe, you know, um, in the future, once everyone is all uh, savvy up on Photography 101, we can move on to like Photography uh, 201 or something in the future. Absolutely. And if anyone ever has any questions, they can. They are more than welcome to reach out and all that good stuff. Like I'm here to help and learn, teach people and all that good stuff. If someone wanted to book a, uh, a wedding or something for you, you know, where would they go? Pretty much um, my business is Megan Lupian Photography. I have a website and they can contact me on my website or they can even give me a call at 757-705-0820. And I, um, I travel a lot for weddings and I just came back from Denver, Colorado and I offer some pretty cool like incentives for people who are outside of the state of Virginia. So if there's any engaged people listening, I might know a wedding photographer. <laughs> You might, you know, have the wedding on Saturday and go hunting on Sunday. Oh, so. yeah, exactly. <laughs> Priorities. <laughs> right, right, right. No, but all right. And then obviously um, you're at Hunt Hickory Creek most of the season, correct? Yep. Yes, sir. So. I'll be there the beginning of December until like the end of February. Awesome. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Lots of fun. I'm so, I'm so excited. I'm so ready. <laughs> yeah, I, I that's pretty much everybody in here um, on, on the Facebook group. You know, it's everyone's talking about, I think if you look at like the most used words on the Facebook, it's duck depression. Yes. Yeah. Withdrawals. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm counting down the days. It'll be here before we know it. I think Wade posted something the other day. It was like, like a two month, two and a half months or something like that till teal season. Yeah, I think I, so. I try not to count. Just I know like, that just seems so far away. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But it'll be here. I'm it'll be here before we know it, thankfully. <laughs> yes, thankfully. So all right. Well, well you thank have you a good so evening, much. So. You too. Great. I'm glad to help. Thank you for everything. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Foul Front Waterfowl Podcast. Please come join us on our Facebook group, the Foul Front Waterfowl Podcast Group, where you can connect with a good group of hunters, because we're all in this together. We need to act like it so that hopefully our great great grandkids will be hunting ducks over our favorite public lands Uh, we also ask that you go ahead and give us a written review on itunes and give us five stars if you think we deserve it and we really do want to hear back from you uh, so that we can give you the best possible content and if you get in on that facebook group you can get in there and you can ask questions and you can tell us what you want to hear next or you can tell us uh, what you don't like and be sure to tailor things to our listeners so all right 
Stay safe out there, and we will see you next week. 